today uh, to, uh, to feed your soul. Amen? Amen. You're not going to get strong in God if you don't take the time to feed your soul. And so uh, thank God for you taking the time out to feed your soul. And uh, for those who are members of the church, making sure that you connect with the church. Amen. If you weren't here in noonday, then you need to know what's going on in Bible study because this is the direction that God is taking us in. So, so very, very thankful to be here with you and also with those who are joining us online. Amen. Y'all turn to Psalm 35. Psalm 35, verse 27. Psalm 35, verse 27. We are still in our series on faith to advance godly causes. Faith to advance godly causes. Amen. I think this is our third installment. Faith to advance godly causes. Psalm 35 and 27 says, Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. So we see, as we said before, that God ties his desire for our prosperity with those who favor his righteous cause. And you see that all throughout the scripture, amen, that God wants to bless those who take that blessing and bless somebody else. Amen. God wants to bless those who put his agenda before their own. Amen. God wants to bless those. He said, I'm going to lift up the, lift up the humble. Amen. But I'm going to take down the proud. So those who, those who humble themselves before him, you are right in line for a blessing. If you humble yourself before him, if you put his cause before your own, his agenda before your own, if you have a heart to be a blessing to others, then God says, that's, that's the kind of people I want to bless. Those are the kind of people I want to, to prosper. Amen? He said, I take pleasure in the prosperity of those people, not my bystanders, not people who are infatuated with me, not people who think the man upstairs is neat, but I, get, I take pleasure in the prosperity of my servants. You see that? You see that? I take pleasure in the prosperity of my servants. So at, for those, that's just one of the I ask you to go ahead and sign up uh, uh, on service lane or whatever. Because God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Not just people who think he neat, who are infatuated with him. Not just folk who love church, but for his serve. When you serve the Lord, you have a justifiable expectation that the Lord will meet your needs so much in abundance that you can be able to meet the needs of other people. Amen. You have a justifiable expectation in that. So that's what we began to look at over the last couple of weeks. On the first week, we looked at what faith is and what, its focus, what is its focus. What is faith and what is its focus? Amen? And uh, what we said was that focus is that it is beyond ourselves. But I wanted to, I, I don't know that I hammered this down, but, but remember the focus of our faith is Jesus. Amen? This is not self-help. These are not motivational speeches. This is not a wellness seminar. Amen? The focus of our faith. Let's, let's turn there real quick. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Can y'all pull that up? Hebrews chapter 11. No, I believe it's verse 6. I'm sorry. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But let me get there first. So I can make sure that that's what I'm looking for. Hebrews chapter 11. Oh, uh, yeah. That's it. That's it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith is so, so they're saying they're tying faith with pleasing him. You don't even have faith that pleases him if you don't believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. So faith is not just a formula to get stuff. Amen? Faith is not just a formula to get stuff. Faith is not like, you know, you know the winning number to the lottery, so you're going to play it. It's not like that. Amen? You figure it's going to be on your birthday and your aunt's birthday put together. That's not, that's not what faith is. Faith is based on Jesus. And faith is our way to please Jesus. 
Amen. That's what separates us from the world. They come up with all kinds. Of, and I'm not saying that some of the stuff that they, they say doesn't work. You know, a broken clock, clock could be uh, right twice a day. So, so sometimes, you know, stuff is just principle driven and stuff like that throughout the earth. If, you, if you're generous, then, then you, you receive supply. If you're good to people, then people are good to you. Those are just universal principles. But now we're not just trying to, to operate in universal principles. We're not just trying to do self-help and wellness. We understand that our faith is about our relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you don't understand that, you don't, you're not getting the most you need to get out of this faith thing. He gave us faith to connect with him. Amen. And some of the benefits of connecting with him is that he will supply our needs. Amen. Some of the benefits of connecting with him is that he will prosper us. Some of the benefits of connecting with him is that he will bring things out of us for our benefit and for the benefit of others. But the baseline is we got faith so we can get closer to who he is. Amen. My faith, if my faith doesn't convince me of anything, it should convince me that he is. Hallelujah. And then that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So I just wanted to make sure I hammer that down. Faith, what is faith and what is its focus? It's beyond ourselves. But now the root of our faith is that we have faith in Jesus. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, found out that all other ground is sinking sand. We also said that when God blesses you, he has more in mind than you. And that's something that we must understand. That when God blesses us, he has more in mind than us. He blesses us so that we can be a blessing. That was week one. Week two, we began to look at what should we have faith for. And we looked at, now this was not exhaustive, but we looked at five things, five divine purposes for our faith fruit. And we looked at, you know, you have to glorify God. Uh, you, you, you share your testimony, all of those things. You could get that from last week. We looked at that. And one of the key statements was, we are not only supposed to use our faith just for ourselves. Amen. I believe that this is why, why God put this in bishop for us to begin to, to deal with over this month so that as we go into next year and God thrust us forward we understand that we use our faith you don't just use your faith to survive amen you don't want to live the kind of life that you just go from one traumatic incident to another traumatic incident just barely holding on and scraping and stuff like that you, you should have faith not just so you can get over Amen. We don't use our faith just so we can get over, so that we can get, so we can have. You want to you wanna be positioned, like we, like we said the last time. There's one thing to be the person. You are blessed if you're, you're the person who's in line to receive a blessing. Amen. That's a blessed place. That's a good place. But it's an elementary understanding of where our faith should take us. That should, if that's where you are, that's where you are. But now that's not where you should want to stay. You don't always want to be the one that folk are handing out stuff to. You should be, as, you, as you're doing that and as you're seeing your needs met and as people are blessing you and so on, you should begin to say, mm, I, I appreciate this, but you, I see myself at the front of the line. Turn the other way around. I want to be the one that's handing stuff out. Because a, because a pipe can't, can't, can't stay dry if water's going through it. So if God is blessing me to bless somebody else, it's obvious that on the back end of this, I've already been blessed. So God, I want to be the person, not just the one who's receiving, but I want to be the resource that you can push stuff through. And not just money. I don't want you to just think money. I want to be the resource of joy. I want to be the resource of temperance. I want to be the peacemaker that's in the situation. I want to be the one who brings the power of the Holy Spirit into the situation. I appreciate folk praying for me, God, but bless me with my faith such that I can turn around and lay hands on somebody myself and see God bless them. I don't want to just be the one in line. I want to be at the, somebody say I want to be at the front of the line. That's what we want to use our faith for. Amen. We are not supposed to use our faith just for ourselves. Because if we do that, we look just like the world. I ain't no rat. I don't want to be in the rat race. Amen. I'm an eagle. I want to soar with God. I want to soar in my faith. So today, today we're going to continue with what should we have faith for. Turn to John chapter 15. 
Now, for some of you in noonday, some of this is going to, a little bit in the front, is going to sound repetitious, but I, the scripture lets me know that I'm a good uh, minister if I put you in remembrance of the things that you have heard. But then also I have to understand that there are people, uh, we didn't quite get as far uh, in the uh, evening service in um, last Wednesday. And there are people who are watching us online, so I want everybody to be able to hear this. Y'all in John chapter 15, verse 16, God has designed us to be fruitful. John chapter 15 verse 16 says, you, sh you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. And that fruit should remain. Amen? And that, that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Now, that's King James. King James says, I realize probably in other versions it says, give it to you. But I like the way that it says that because that, that reveals a truth. That reveals a truth that God wants to progress you not just from giving something to you. He wants to be able to give you to something. Isn't that good? He wants to progress you, not just to be giving stuff to you, but he wants to be able to give. He said that about Titus. He said, I'm sending Titus down there because there's nobody else that I know that it can establish a grace in you. Amen? And so sometimes God wants to give, give it you. And so we want to grow in our faith to the point that God can put us on assignment. Amen? I've seen I've seen different people like uh, you know even in the church who um, they they saw you know, something was not necessarily running real good and so they decided I'm going to go and, and, and work from the inside and I'm going to go and fi find out what they're doing and help and stuff like that and as they began to help the ministry started to prosper and started to grow. You don't allow the size of our church or the way that we run or the fact that it seems to run so much better than where you came from before. You don't allow that to make some somehow make you think that you are not necessary. God wants to give it you. Yeah. Amen. God needs you to be on post. Yeah. Amen. God needs you to be available. God needs you to be prayerful. Amen. God needs all of us to pray for our pastor and to pray for the vision of the church. You, you don't just say, well, I'm sure there's a whole lot of other leaders praying. No, that, no, 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 no. No, God gave it me. I'm here for a reason. I'm here for a purpose. What can I do to help push this thing forward? Because we're here to change the lives of many. And so, God, I thank you that once I came, when I first came in here, God, it was a healing time. And so I kind of sat a little quiet and stuff and didn't want to bother nobody because I was trying to get myself together. But, Lord, I realized that that's a season that has to pass. Eventually, I get to a place where I say, okay, God, what are you giving me to? How can I use my faith to further godly causes? So he says, listen, I, I, I ordained you. I'm the one who called you. You think you, called, you chose me, but I chose you. And I ordained you that you should bear fruit, that we should be fruitful. In Genesis chapter 126, he says, I want you to go be fruitful and multiply. So God put us here on this earth so that we could bear fruit, so that we could reproduce something of what he put in us, he wants us to reproduce in others. Amen? That's what we talk about in Cornelia, having a fellowship, being a fellowship that strengthens, that every encounter that we personally have with other people, they should leave better and more aware of the love of Jesus Christ by us being there. God gave it you. God gave them you. Amen? And so uh, he called us to bear fruit. We must understand that there is a cause that we must uphold. Just like it said, he said, I want to bless those who favor my righteous cause. There's a cause that we must uphold. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Yeah, God, you have to ask yourself certain questions sometimes. Why am I here? You know, what, what am I, why am I at this job? Why am I, why am I part of this family? Why, why am I at this church? Why do I live in this neighborhood? Why, why do I live in this area, in this city? You know, I didn't even heard, heard nothing about a Greenville other than South Carolina until I got here. Why, God, did you put me here? And 
and the, and the answer to that should be, okay, God, well, whatever it is that you have me here for, I'm going to put my hand to it. Amen? Faith is not just an attitude, but it's an action word, right? And so I'm going to put my hand to something because I, I appreciate that you put me here for a reason. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You know, we sing the song, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. And see, the thing about being a soldier is that, that you, you're stripped from your own agenda and your assignment becomes the, the main focus of your daily life. And so he's saying, listen, we are soldiers and we are at war. And it should be plain to see. I don't, I don't think you can look at the news honestly and not see that some stuff is wrapping up. And I know they've been saying Jesus is coming back for a long time, but that just means it's closer. Amen. They're talking about our president getting ready to just rile up the folk. They already hate us over there. They already hate us. They don't even know why they, well, no, they know why they hate us. There's a whole lot of history behind that. But, yeah, they already don't like us. And so then he want to go and be right big and bold and go over there and move the embassy from Tel Aviv to, to Jerusalem, you know, because he's trying to appease to some people who don't quite understand that there's some missiles that could be floating over our head. Yeah, we got to pray. Amen. With the with the division, the, the divisiveness and the hatred that permit has permeated our country. Amen. To the point that people who are filled with hate and division, uh, you know, they feel like they have an advocate. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Just as soon as, as soon as it looked like he was gonna get elected, folk got froggy. <laughs> Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Folk got froggy, folk got, got bold. They were hiding in the trenches and stuff because they felt like the country, you know, they, they were going to get trouble. But then once they got this guy who they felt like was their advocate, they just come right out with stuff now. And you begin to see what people really think. And if you're not careful, it could be disheartening. That's why we should use our faith. We are at war. So I praise God for nice houses and cars and trips and things like that. We know that, you know, praying people ought to travel. Praise God for all of that. And put your faith toward that. Put your faith toward promotion on your job. Put your faith toward getting that, you know, beautiful thing that you want, all of that. But we must understand that our faith is also because we are at war. We must have a consciousness of the fact that while we are here, the church scripture tells us that we should occupy until he comes. Amen? An occupation is a is a taking a taking over when you have an occupying army come into a town what that means is they they set up martial law in that town and they take over the government god said i want you i don't want you to just rest here and chill here i want you to take over I know you look you you can't wait till I get here. I can't you can't wait till I come back. But while you're waiting for me to come back, I want you to go in like an army and take over on your job in Jesus' name. Take over in the hospital in Jesus' name. Take over in the school system in Jesus' name. Take over in government uh, 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 positions in Jesus' name. I want you to go in there and I want you to infuse Christ in every situation that you're in. You are called to be a soldier in this army and we are at war. Somebody say we are at war. Now, since we understand this, if we understand the seriousness of our times, the scripture says, no man that warreth entangleth himself. And so, of course, I saw that word as a big word. I said, what does that mean? And so, as I began to look it up, entangleth means to entwine, to, to, in, to get involved in, to get wrapped up or twisted into. And also means to make complicated. So the scripture is letting us know you don't entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. You don't get twisted up with it. You don't get too attached with it. You don't get too wrapped up in it. And you don't let the affairs of this life complicate your faith. You don't get wrapped up in it. You don't get twisted up in it. You don't get too involved in it. And you don't allow the affairs or this world system, you don't allow it to complicate your faith. Well, what do you mean by complicate my faith? The faith is very simple. We have faith in Jesus Christ and what he says. No matter what the culture disputes. 
We, we, we live in a time, if you want to marry somebody, all you got to do is go online and take, I don't know, fill a form out or something like that. And then all of a sudden, you are a reverend. You may not even care nothing about Jesus. You don't know nothing about him. But in the name of some kind of church of the universal whatever, you can stand up and you can proclaim vows over somebody. That's this culture. So they're trying, what they're trying to do, this world is trying to take away the significance of the church, to take away the significance of the body of Christ, to try to make, and it sounds so smooth. I, you know, I'm not really into organized religion, but I do, I do you know, believe in God. I'm not into organized religion. I don't believe in that. But I, and I read the Bible among other things. So it's trying to strip the significance of the root of faith. And remember, our faith is not just in stuff. Our faith is not just based on what works and what doesn't. Our faith is built on Jesus. If, if, what, if, if living for Jesus makes life harder, if living for Jesus means I don't get the new car, if living for Jesus means I don't get the house, if living for Jesus means I don't have a whole bunch of friends, it's still worth it to live for Jesus. We are at war, and we cannot allow this world system, this way of life, this culture to define what we should be and how we should live. Amen? Even as KCC, as we look at our DNA, our DNA is made up of culture changers. Our DNA is made up of, of we, we, are, we are trailblazers. So it's not just for our church. That should be for you. You should be a trail. You have to understand that the person who goes first also always gets persecuted. Did you know that? The person who goes first always gets persecuted. The person who started talking about Listen, I believe that that's going to come a day where everybody will have a computer in their home. Back when you had to have a whole room about half of the size of this thing over here in order to have a computer. Folk look at you are crazy. And I look today, we holding a computer in our hand that is a hundred times more powerful than, the, than what they use to get to the moon. Anybody who goes first it's going to be persecuted. So even in your family, as you go first into Jesus, you don't, you don't throw shade on them or nothing like that. You, and sometimes you can't even really listen to what they're saying. You have to be like Jesus. Lord, I forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't quite understand. I've gone first and so they try, you know, they're trying to look at it and throw shade on it. But that's okay because I understand if I hold my, if I hold my course... That's a part of faith. If I hold my course, this thing going to come back around and they'll begin to see that the Jesus that I put my whole life on and the church that I committed my time to and my treasure to, that it is the thing that's going to cause salvation in our family. They may not see it initially, but as I am in war, I don't I look at the culture and people around me to define and tell me what is important. I look to Jesus. Holy Spirit, you tell me what to do and it may be popular and it may not be. But none of, that's ma none of that matters. That's what real faith is. See, faith is not just about, you know, getting stuff. Real faith is I'm going to stand and I'm going to put my, my, my effort toward your agenda, Jesus. So, so, so you don't want to be entangled. Somebody say you don't want to be entangled. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 1. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 1 says, we then, as workers together with him, meaning Jesus, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. So we want to live our lives in such a way. We want to live our lives, like the scripture says, you can't please him without faith. We want to live our lives in such a way that the most important thing can, that can be clearly seen, that most important thing is we want to please Jesus. And so what that causes, it, it, what that causes is an expansion of our faith. So our faith does not have the narrow focus of just making us comfortable. Amen? Once we understand that there's a charge that God has called us to, that we have an assignment, there's a charge to keep that we have. Once we understand that, then it expands our faith. 
Because if you're only believing for a narrow focus, you will only see narrow results. But when you begin to pray, God, I pray for the world. I pray for my world. I pray for my city. You begin to see how big God is because you're asking him to do big stuff. Don't limit your God. And don't limit the ability of your God to work through you. Don't limit the ability of your God to work through you. You don't know what that prayer will do. You don't know what that letter will do. You don't know what that meal that you cook for that person will do. You, you don't know what that standing up for somebody in, in the midst of people picking on them, but you stand up and say, uh-uh, y'all back up off. You don't know what that will do. You don't know what God is able to do through you. But if you keep a narrow focus of just surviving yourself, you won't be able to see the power of God that can work in your life. But when you say, God, what can I do for my church? What can I do for my city? What can I do in this and in that? Then you begin to see how big God can be and that's what our faith is for remember we said a charge to keep I have that's what Charles Wesley said a God to glorify a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky we are not only supposed to use our faith just for ourselves because if so we just look like the world now notice I did not say use our faith just for church causes. I, I didn't just say j just for, for church. I think that's one of the reasons why that we, we've, in our, in our particular culture, there's, there, there's a lot of infighting and stuff like that in churches because everybody thinks that the only thing that they can do is something that can be seen. It's almost as if the only thing I can do is somebody, something that somebody can look at on Sunday. And so if we try to dispense every kingdom job out on Sunday in the four walls, then there's too much competition. And if you look at it that way, if that's the only way you look at being able to be helpful in, 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 to, to the body of Christ, then you sometimes can, can look back and say, well, they don't really need me. But you don't understand, even if you don't have a place or something to do specifically that can be seen in the four walls. There are things behind the scenes in the four walls, and there are things where we want you to go out there and do in the name of Jesus. So it's not just church causes. What we mean is kingdom causes. What Bishop means is kingdom causes. Listen to this. The church is the body of Christ. This is one of our definitions in the earth. The church is the body of Christ in the earth. It is an organized organism made up of believers in Jesus who serve as his physical extension and function and standard. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. You cannot uh, reduce the importance of the church. Just like she said on Sunday, you can't tell me that you love the head and then don't love the body. And vice versa. So for you to say, I love Jesus, but I can't stand these folk, then you missing the point because you can't, you can't love my head and then want me, you want me to cut my head off? Well, you, you got to have all of it. It's all together. Amen? And so likewise, you can't say that you love, the, the scripture says in First John, you can't say you love Jesus and don't love your brother. Amen? So, so, so you cannot allow this culture to try to demean the importance of the church. We are the church. Uh, his, his organized organism made up of believers in Jesus who serve as his physical extension and function and standard. In other words, when Jesus was in the body, when Christ was in the body called Jesus, he could only be certain places at certain times. So he said, listen, it's expedient for me to go away from here. Because if I don't go, then the Holy Spirit can't come. But when he comes, he's going to get in you and work through you such that now Christ can be everywhere all over the world and is everywhere all over the world. He can be right here, but at the same time, he could be up in Simpson, and, and he could be in Simpson, and at the same time, he could be over in Charlotte, and at the same time, he could be in California because he's in us, and we are the physical extension. Y'all know how an extension cord is. If the cord is too short, you had to add an extension cord so it can make it to the power source. So we are connected to the power source, and therefore there's a greater reach that God is able to do. We are the church. We are part of the church, meaning the body of Christ made of all believers from our all time, eternity, past, and through the future and present. 
We are part of the body of Christ. That's why a lot of the foolishness that's going on nowadays is so disheartening. Because really division, you, you can see the greatest level of division with church folks. I'm not going to say with Christians. Because I don't know. Not the way some of us are acting. But with church folks. And see, we hold the moral standards that the world looks to. Even, the, even though they talk bad about us, they still look to us as moral standards. Even if just for criticism. So when they see Christians or church folk who are divided and can't get along, we don't have to agree politically. Amen? But what we do have to understand is Jesus is not a part of a political party. He's not a Republican. He ain't no Democrat. He's not an Independent. He God. <laughs> that stuff is so far below him, it don't even make sense to tie it to him. Amen? And so we, as the body of Christ, as people, we all bleed the same color. But then as Christians, we all are covered with the same blood. There should be a, 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 a I don't agree with you about that. I don't agree with you about that. But what we do agree about is Jesus is Lord. We can work together. We can love one another. We can live with one another. You see what the, what the enemy's trying to do? Trying to break the church apart. But somebody said the devil is a liar. Hallelujah. And, and you really can only control the behavior of yourself. And so we know as Koinonia members, we're not going to be those who, who, who fan the flames of disunity and hatred in our country. Uh-uh. We might get mad about some of the stuff we see, but we understand that God has called us to love. To love one another and then to take that love and give it to the world. That's what we use our faith for. So we are the body of Christ. We are part of the church, meaning the body of Christ. We are members of a church, meaning the local church. And every believer is called to live out their Christian life in submission and service inside of a local church. Every believer. It is God's intent that every believer lives out their life in submission and service inside of a local church. Submission, service, and fellowship. That we come together and that the four walls are not the local church. It is the place where the local church meets. So it don't matter where we meet as long as we do. Yeah, really the walls of the local church is the vision. And so you know that the vision is far bigger than these four walls. The expanse of the vision becomes the walls of the local church. And so we cannot look at it just based off of a building. That's why you don't just join a church because the building is comfortable. Amen. Because anything could happen to this building. But now the church is the collection of believers that are under one vision who serve and submit and fellowship with one another, who live our lives together with Jesus and for Jesus. Amen? So that we, we are part of the, the church, the body of Christ. We are members of a local church for, for, for many of you in here and those who are part of Cornelia, but whatever church that you are a part of, give your heart to, 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 to being a part of that, to being engaged in your church. And then we are a church. Meaning we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Our place or role between church and kingdom, though, is, is never either or or. We don't choose church or kingdom. Because church is bigger than the four walls. Church, I can I could be in church by having a conversation with somebody in Africa. You love Jesus, I love Jesus too. This is church here because we are both a part of the body of Christ. I can also be at 
church in my local church which is my station by which God launches me and, and gives me fellowship and family so that I can grow and I can go and serve God but then also everywhere I go I'm at church because I am a church I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit so now I can't just look at my service to God in just now we want everybody to sign up for a ministry in KCC but that's not all you do because everywhere you go you carry your faith. In every atmosphere that you are in, you carry your faith. So we don't say either or as far as church and kingdom. It is always and. Church and kingdom. Church and kingdom. Therefore, kingdom impact it extends in many places. Kingdom impact extends with my church bond, my local church bond. Every believer should be joined to, submitted to, and functioning in a local church to be matured and have God's plan for his or her life. I, I can't just say, I love Jesus. I get everything I need from Jesus. I can look at the internet and then look at it like that and say, well, I don't need to be a part of a local church because we are supposed to be bonded together under a singular vision that we help bring to pass amen so part of my kingdom impact part of my kingdom existence is my connection to my local church what do you mean by that reverend now some people might have the type of career or job you're going to make kingdom impact with your job so you're a dancer or an actor or something like that or a pilot. So you, you can't be, you can't serve on the ushers probably, possibly, I don't know, you have to look at yourself. But there may be particular ministries that have to do something every Sunday that you can't do because you were away a lot. So what you do is, wherever I go, I'm taking Jesus with me and I'm going to serve him. But I keep my bond to my local church. I pray for my church. I listen to the prayer call. I watch and I stream online. I'm always, if, if there's a ministry that I can do while I'm away, I got a computer. There's got to be something I can do with my computer to help my church. I am bonded to my, this is my place of connection. This is my tether. This is my anchor. I've seen people who start working a job and they start working more and more and more and what they don't understand is, okay, well, you, you had to work that job, whatever, but they don't understand. I got to work just, I got to work even harder to keep the bond to my local church. Because if I keep staying away and I don't, I don't stay connected, I don't call my elder, I don't call my deacon, I don't check in with stuff, I don't get people's notes, I don't keep, I don't, I'm not intentional while keeping my church bond, what you end up doing is you float further and further away, and logic will help you to, to justify what you're doing. Well, it seems like I got more today than them people get in church. I sat here and streamed, and I just got here, and it is, and you start justifying certain things. I, I just I read my scriptures and I got revelation and that stuff will fool you somebody say fool you because God called you to be connected to your local church so as you serve in the kingdom you remain grounded and anchored in the place that God called you to be under so my kingdom impact extends to my church by my kingdom impact extends to my community involvement we should take on a cause by utilizing spiritual gifts, natural talents, personal and partner generated resources, teamwork and networking to glorify God and touch the lives of others in his name. There will be some people running for political office in our church. You got more sense than some of the people that, that are voting. Amen. And we already can see you don't necessarily have a, have a whole lot of qualifications or public service in order to run. <laughs> so, <laughs> some, of us need to be, some of us need to be on some boards and different organizations. Amen? We, need to, we should be missionaries. So they, they, we should be able to go places with folk who look like us seeing folk who look like them carrying resources and help y'all got quiet on that now come on now how is it that we don't go nowhere 
we just hang around. I appreciate the mission field of Greenville, but I mean, not everybody is called to exclusively be here. Amen? And so we should be going out and impacting. We should be going out. And in, in your company, you could be, um, like, like Bishop was talking about, Denzel Washington and his wife. They, they saved to the bone. I believe Angela Bassett, too. They saved to the bone. But they have to go in there to do these roles that are, you know, kind of controversial and stuff because that's what they do. That's their job. But what they do is they stay connected to their local church and wherever they are, it is clear once, the, once, the, once it says cut, once it says cut, it is clear who they live for. Amen? So wherever we go, we have community impact. Some of these boards and some of these things, you flies on the wall. You can see what's going on in the city. But at the same time, you uphold Jesus Christ and the standard of his character wherever you are. And we should impact political systems. We should impact school systems. We should impact city systems and, and city planning. Amen. City planning is big. We should impact city planning. You think that all this stuff, stoplights and all this stuff just be coming up for no reason? No, it's because people are involved. And so when you see a road getting ready to be cut in front of your front yard, it's because somebody went to a meeting and made that happen. And so we need to be there. We've had times when there's different stuff we're going to go around here and then KCC showed up in masses and the folk were like, whoa, what in the world? And it moves things. It moves votes. It moves, it moves things. And so we should be, our, our kingdom impact should extend to our church bond. It should extend to our community involvement. And it should commit, could extend to our career excellence and promotion. To represent our Lord through the pursuit of excellence in our place of employment. And to live as an example of the faith and make connections with people, impacting them through your personal interaction and superior work ethic and quality output, all for the glory of God. I say it again. Our career excellence and promotion, our kingdom impact, is to represent our Lord through the pursuit of excellence in our place of employment. To live as an example of the faith. And make connections with people. Now be snobby. Don't be off to yourself. You carry Jesus with you. So you make connections with people. You, get, you should be well known in your place of work. Amen? So they can begin to see the example of your faith. And the example of your character. To make connections with people. Impacting them through your personal interaction. Through your superior work ethic. And quality output. All giving glory to God while you do it. Girl, you got that project done like that? Yeah, I had to stay over a little bit. You know, I had to stay over a few nights. nights this, this. Did, they, did they pay you for staying over? Well, that's not the point. I want to do quality work. The Lord blessed me too much for me not to give my best to this job. Oh, okay. All right. All right, well, you go on then. And then they just watch you. Well, they watch you when you come in late, too. They watch you when you take lunch too long. They watch, you, they watch you while you're talking and playing on the phone when you're supposed to be working. Amen? Right, don't they? They ain't nothing more worse than we go up to the register of somebody and somebody is preoccupied talking to their friends and stuff or talking to the customer in front of them. So you standing in line, here's the girl, oh, child, who, mm, it's good to see you. And I'm fine, go and do that greeter. But now y'all going to be talking 10 minutes and all of us standing in line, y'all need to do that later. Call, say, I call you on my break. <laughs> and I don't care whether you're talking about church or nothing, that, that you are holding the line up. <laughs> Amen? So we, in the, we represent Jesus Christ and the kingdom by the excellence of, of our work, the superior work ethic, and the quality of our output, and we all give Jesus the credit. So it extends to our church bond, to our community involvement, and to our career excellence and promotion. We need to use our faith for the kingdom. We need to use our faith for kingdom projects. Amen? Well, what is my church up to? What are we doing? Well, how can I help? How can I, how can I give talent, time, and treasure toward this? You know, I, you know I, well, what kind of offering can I give? What, what kind of time can I give? What kind of work can I put toward it? 
Lord. I, I, I'm not going to be one of those people that thinks that stuff just happens. I'm not going to be a person just, to just watch his stuff come up. But if I can't do anything else, Lord, I'll pray about it. Like, who's praying for the buildings? I mean, I know we're excited about it. But now we need to be praying about that, too. Bishop just told me something yesterday. We, we need to be praying. We need to be praying. Not that there's anything bad going on, but it's just that there's, there's more resources, there's more time, there's more. You need to be praying for the infrastructure. You need to pre be praying that the vision is expanded by what we're doing. Amen? You always, in everything that you see going on, you say, okay, God, how can I be praying about that? We got a revival or something coming up or a power class coming up. Lord, how, what can I do to begin to pray so that Bishop gets greater revelation in that? I want to be engaged and involved in whatever my church is up to, whatever kingdom project they are up to, all right? You have to be willing to put in effort of faith to see the plans of God come to pass in our generation. It doesn't just happen. It must be asserted. It must be engaged. Number two, kingdom promises. We believe for God's supply. Second Chronicles 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him uh, amen to the glory of God. So God has already allotted certain things for us. But now his desire from Genesis 12.2 is that he will, he will make of thee a great nation and will bless thee and make thy name great. Tur go there. Gen Did I say Chronicles? Thank you so much. Second Corinthians 1.20 was the first one. And then the second one is Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, which says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So he says, listen, all the promises are yea and amen. First Chronicle, First Corinthians, excuse me again. First, second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, says that all the promises of God are yea and amen. In other words, I already allotted that stuff for you. But now what I've given to you, I want you to be blessed, but I want you to be a blessing. So we need to, to extend our faith for kingdom promises, not just for us, but for others. God, get me to, get me to a place of stabilization in my finances. And in all areas of prosperity, in my health, in my joy, God, I want to be healthy so I can do more for you. So God, help me with this sugar addiction or this salt addiction or this ham addiction or whatever it is. Help me with that, God, that's, help, that, that's jeopardizing my health so that I can get to a place where I'm stronger so I can do more for you. God, I have trouble in my mind. Help me get stabilized in my mind and have joy and peace. And you said anybody whose mind is stayed on you, that's the one you keep in perfect peace. God, I pray for that peace because I want to get to a place of stabilization such that that can be a launching pad by which I can be a blessing. And you use your faith for that. So for kingdom, um, for kingdom projects, for kingdom promises, for kingdom promises, where we use our time, talent, and treasure to solve problems. If you ever want to find your purpose, you find your problem. You want to find your purpose, you find your problem. In other words, what's the thing that eats you up? Then when you see it, it just gets on your nerves. What's the thing that bothers you but don't seem to bother nobody else? Maybe you might be coming up and you see some landscaping or something like that and say, and everybody just walking past it and you say, now somebody need to trim that bush. It don't make no sense. And it bothers you. You're trying to get through worship and stuff, but it is bothering you. I can't believe ain't nobody out there. I got some clippers or something out there in the car. I ought to walk out there right now and just go on and trim that thing. <laughs> it's bothering you. don't bother nobody else. Well, it means that you care about the beautification of the house of God. That's your problem. So then you find a way to get involved so you can be helpful. Some of you could be looking at a program or something like that or some kind of publication and say, now them people know that that subject verb agreement does not work. Why they put that predicate in that place right there? And that bothers you. Well, you don't just say, well, it sucks that bother. I, just, I can't believe it. No, you say, okay, God, well, how can I use this? This is my problem. This bothers me. Don't seem to bother nobody else. How can I use it? For some of us, it's like children who are, are, are being mistreated or children who are hungry. Other people can hear it and say, oh, that's, you know, that's, mm, that's really bad. But then for you, you can't get to sleep that night. It's because that's your problem. So then you say, well, God, how can I engage that? 
What can I do to help to help the food hungry and the, and the food insecure? What can I do for that? Some of the, some of you see our elderly people who are being mistreated, and it doesn't seem to bother everybody like it bothers you. Well, God, how can I get that? You see what I'm saying? You find your problem. Amen. For some of you, you see single mothers and the, and the sons don't seem to have, you know, any, any, any father figures in their life. And you see them going astray. And other people can pass it by and say, look at that dear child. This is a worsome child. And you're thinking, they're not worsome. They just don't have any guidance. So you begin to think, well, what kind of programs can I put together? See, that's your problem. What kind of programs can I put together and present to the leadership of the church that I can help? Or if it's, if it's in the church, but even if it's out there, you go say, well, I'm going to work for the Boys and Girls Club so that I can be a godly example. For where I am and I'm gonna give Jesus all the credit while I do it you find your problem you find your purpose we were made to solve problems someone say I was made to solve problems I gotta use my faith to help solve problems and then finally number four and number five for kingdom partners using my faith for divine and beneficial connections. God, I pray for the favor of God that somebody somewhere will uh, use their power, their influence, their resources, and their abilities to help me. God, I thank you that you put me in the, in the presence of the people that I need to know and in the path of the things that I need to know that are critical for my success. God, I thank you for divine connections in my life and I put my faith toward that so, Lord, I can begin to partner because I can do more with help than I can do by myself for you. Then finally, for kingdom prospects, walking in our calling to win the loss to Christ. I put my faith down to say, God, what can I do to be a blessing to win souls to Christ? Do, do these uh, Psalm 2 and 8 says, ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the othermost parts of the earth for thy possession. God just said, ask. Ask. And if I put that as a priority, God says, you all start, you see that altar this Sunday? Did y'all see that altar this Sunday? At 9 and at 12. We have folk all down this aisle. Amen? That, that comes through prayerfulness. That, that doesn't just come through preaching, but it comes through prayerfulness as well, where people's hearts are pricked to hear that word that goes out. That's something we should look for, not just as a, a, an occasional occurrence, but as our inheritance. We believe for souls. We believe for souls. We claim them as our inheritance. It belongs to the kingdom, and we claim it in Jesus' name. And then finally, Proverbs 11.30 says, the fruit of the righteous. Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. God, I believe you for wisdom as I deal with my cousin, my brother, my sister. I believe you for wisdom as I deal with my coworkers. I put my faith toward those things. And as you do these, as you do these, for kingdom projects, for kingdom promises, prom problems, partners, and prospects, as you do this, you begin to see an expansion of your faith, and you'll be shocked and surprised what God is able to do because of what, you're, what you have put your hand to to believe for. Amen? Father, thank you so much for the word that we received today. Bless us, God, to go out and use our faith for your purpose and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.